Dr. Bennis, welcome to Leadership Track. It's great to have you here today. Thank you, Mick. By the way, I'm glad you said art of leadership because I think it is, in general, an art form. Well, we are privileged to have you here uh, to be exposed to some of the things that you've done. You've written so many books. How do you write so many books? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. It's a uh, gift. When I was first starting and wrote a lot, one of my colleagues behind my back said, he doesn't write, he types. <clears throat> that may account for some of that. That's great. Well, yeah. you, your most recent book is Geeks and Geezers. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting title, Geeks yeah. and Geezers. Well, would you explain that to our viewers? Explain it to me. What is that yeah. title all about? The book was about leaders um, 32 years and younger, people of achievement, young, youngsters of achievement, men and women, um, people who had done important things in their lives, like Sky Dayton, who founded Earthlink, or a um, woman who founded Teach America. Uh, and I was in, very interested in what their worldview was. What do the young people think? These, these are the people I teach at USC. They were the only generation brought up digitally, visually, um, graphically, with the, with the internet, with communication. And I was also interested in, so what, how, do they, how has it affected their worldview, their spirituality, their values, their ambitions, their aspirations, their hopes? How would they be different from your generation? And you're in between, Mick. Your generation and, and mine. So that's what the book was about. Younger people and older people. Because I think the issue facing society, increasing will be um, these, these generations really connecting with one another. Did you find some commonalities between the two groups? Lots, lots. Um, an appetite for learning, a curiosity. Um, before we actually were put on screen, you asked me about the word neotony. Sure. N e o t e n y. It's a great word. Neotony. Explain that. Yeah. yeah. I love that term. Well, it, it's a biological um, word having to do with natural selection, <clears throat> and without going into a lot of details about it, it's got to do with the um, uh, having um, younger um, characteristics into old age. That eyebrows raised in curiosity, that sense of wonder. You see, well, the young people have that and the older people have that. People who keep living have that sense of wonder in the world. And, the, and they're, they're, they've never had enough learning in their lives. They just keep going for it. And they keep putting themselves in situations where they can learn. Th these are people who seek adventure, who, um, who are also first-class noticers about what's going on in society. I like that concept term, though, first-class first noticers. Class mm -hmm. noticer. yeah. You see that among people who are continually alive. Um, and you notice it when it's not there, because people can be living, but they're not, but in some ways they're dead. Mm -hmm. These geezers and these geeks were sure. so alive. Uh, I call it to stretching your circle of comfort, always doing that no matter what mm -hmm. age you are. Mm -hmm. And that involves learning. Yes. Leaders are learners, learners are leaders, and you must stretch your circle of comfort, and uh, I've used your term many times, become a first-class noticer. Mm, you have used it, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when did it first occur to you that you were a leader? I'm not sure I knew I was a leader, but I, but I felt I have to try it. And even though I was in the Army in World War II and led a platoon and then a company, um, that was um, kind of a, like an accident. But it was in, it was in college where my college president, this man named Douglas McGregor, had a great impact on me. And he came in my second year. I was a, a veteran coming back and he was the president. He was from MIT and I just so admired him, and so admired what he stood for, which was to be reflective, to understand the human condition and the human spirit, to um, he created a set of goal sessions where we really tried to understand what this college was all about. And he, and he infuriated the faculty because he really said, no classes for the next four Fridays. We're just gonna talk about what this college should be. And I just, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but I, I recruited him. And I tell my students to stalk mentors. I stalked him. I, I wanted to be him. And he'd be, and, and he'd been at MIT, and he was a college president, and I liked the way he was, and I liked what he stood for, and I said, I want to be a college president then. 
That's interesting. Yeah. Now you talk about the crucible of learning too. Uh, why is that an important concept? And what do you mean by crucible? Is that uh, something yeah. we go through that's yeah. tough and difficult? Right. Crucible is a trial, a test. I think we have them all the time. I taught a graduate class this last fall semester, Mick, and there was one young man in it. This is a graduate seminar on leadership. There was one young man in it from the Kennedy School who claimed he'd never had a crucible. I said, come on. What do you mean you never had a crucible? He said, well, I, the truth is he had not observed them. He had a lot. We all have these, every day in every organization, there are crucibles going on organically as we live and breathe. They're, they're, and sometimes they're profound, like a Mandela and Robin being in prison in Robin Island for 27, years, 27 and a half years, or um, being in the wilderness for 40 years, or, um, I mean, there's some crucibles that, that are unmistakable. They could even be invisible to other people, yes. and we're going through those ourselves. It could right. be emotional, psychological. Right. And it's hard for people to get, get that sometimes because I was co-moderating a group recently and my co-moderator is one of the men I really enormously regard and for him, his crucible was not getting admitted to Harvard Law School after applying three times. Now someone in the group had, you know, grew up in a family that was poor, that was impoverished, that mother it was institutionalized, and he said, how could you make that, how could that be your crucible? I mean, like, how do you compare crucibles? Because it's never sure. quite the same. What was my crucible? And um, so we all have our crucibles, and how, and I, I want to tell you something that's really important, Mick, and a, and a little bit um, bold, because I can't prove it yet. But what we discovered in the book Geeks and Geezers, my co-author and me, Bob Thomas, was that how one copes with adversity how one transcends and, and learns from adversity, those qualities are identical to the qualities of leadership. Now that's what's interesting. That's, I, I can see where that would be yeah. uh, a theory that could be easily proven though. I think it can be, yeah. We didn't in the book, but we know that it's a testable hypothesis. Now you've, you've seen a lot of leaders over time and uh, you've seen a lot of crashes. Mm -hmm. um, is there any pattern that would be something that you would see in leaders that fail? Some things that you've mm -hmm. seen there that uh, mm -hmm. it could be cues. Mm -hmm. One is this sounds this sounds really banal, trivial. Not really listening to their social network. That means their direct reports. That means their customers. If it's a business, that means their clients. If they're in a profession, it means the congregation. If you're a pastor, it means my students. When you, the fatal error, if you look at leaders who failed, there were two, Mar Margaret Thatcher had eight terrific years, Margaret Thatcher did, but then she became arrogant. And, and that means in my book, arrogance is stop, not listening. The best examples from Shakespeare. The best examples are always from Shakespeare, Julius Caesar. You use this. a lot of Shakespeare, by the way. Yeah, I do, <laughs> yeah. And, but that story is a brilliant example of not listening. Here's this great man, 44 before Christ. He controlled the world at that time, as we knew it. I mean, a huge military leader. But he wasn't paying attention. And, uh, and it, as, the, as the play in history opened it, there was a blind seer who shouts across the market square, beware of the Ides of March, which was the next day. And Caesar turned to one of his cohort groups and said, what did he say? He said, oh, he's a fool. But what did he say? He said, beware of the Ides of March. He wakes up that morning, Ides of March, and his wife, Calpurnia, tells him about a dream she had. And in the dream, there was a statue of Caesar in the town square with a hundred spouts coming from the statue, oozing blood, and lusty Romans were washing their hands in his blood. She said, she said, you cannot go out to that stadium this morning, Caesar. I mean, you're, you're, your life is in danger. Another aide had told him to beware of Casca, to beware of Cassius, to beware of Brutus. And he didn't listen. He did not listen. I find that not listening and knowing who to listen to, Mick, as the most fatal, well, the, the most frequent and often the most fatal error in leaders. They stop listening to the market or they stop listening to the 
they, they've, they have, um, and part of this is success. That's what's so paradoxical about it. Part of it is that, with, like with Caesar, he was the most incredible leader of that part of that time of the year. I mean, in history, he's one of the great leaders. Um, and he stopped listening, and he brings you down. Mm -hmm. I, I want to just add one other thing to that. Habit mm -hmm. is a gr this is a line from a play. Habit is a great deadener. Now, I want to argue that successful habit is even a greater deadener. I like that. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Dr. Bennis is going to talk to us about the kinds of qualities we look for in people that we hire. What kinds of things should we be looking for in leaders? We'll be right back. Leadership Track is a leadership development resource for leaders who want to grow their leadership ability and influence. The primary focus of our resource menu is self-leadership. If you're ready for the adventure, log on to leadershiptrack.com. You'll find Leadership Track Televised, a 30-minute interview with successful leaders who share what they've learned on their leadership journey. Leadership FAQs, a brief missive that provides insight into a myriad of leadership topics like change, teamwork, and conflict resolution. Leadership Track is also available for on-site training and keynote events. Share the wealth of information with your entire team. Visit leadershiptrack.com today. Empowering leaders to live life on purpose. Welcome back to Leadership Track. Our guest today is Dr. Warren Bennis, author of over 25 books on leadership, uh, probably the most renowned expert on leadership that the world has today. Uh, Dr. Bennis, can anybody become a leader, in your opinion? If they want to. That's too, I know that's too quick an answer, but I mean that. We can all improve. Uh, the idea that leaders are born, not made, I think is a dangerous, and it's a cop-out mm. notion. Because we all, but the question is, Another thing I should have added earlier about why some leaders fail is that do you really want to lead? Do you want to take the responsibility of being the servant of other people? Do you want to wake up every day with a to-do list of a hundred people who need to see you, who want to see you, who, who should see you, and you have to think about them that night before you go to bed? And your life is, I mean, there's a tremendous challenge to it. But you, do you really want to, and my, my boss at USC, Steve Sample, wrote a book called The Contrarian's Guide to Leadership. It's a very good book. And the thing that resonated with me, with me the most was many people want to, want to be a leader, but not all that many want to do leader. The, the gritty, complex responsibilities. The hard work, the, the hard discipline. Work. Yeah. yeah. What has been, uh, over the past five years, let's say, the, the greatest change in leadership? And I'll throw another question right on there. What do you think is going to change over the next five years? Ooh. Well, that's, the second one is a bit harder. Let's see. The I get to ask the questions, yeah, you see. I got the easy part. Yeah, <laughs> right. The um, two or three things about the first question, what's changed the most over the... I think we are going through a period of almost dyspeptic distrust of our institutions and their leaders. Due to scandals, due to unethical practices in business, due to a fracturing of the kind of trust that I think was more present when I was growing up as a, as a kid in the 30s and so forth. I think that's one thing. And I think the second thing is much more complexity of leadership, much, many more demands, much harder Honestly, Mick, to have work-life balance as a leader, you've really got to sacrifice. You're really on the line. For those who are in a position of hiring, uh, what kinds of things would they be looking for in perhaps a person they're hiring? I, I think IQ is interesting. I'd want a, per, a certain amount, but not necessarily. What I want is a person who wants to learn 
a person who has an appropriate degree of ambition, hard to define, but a person who really wants to make a difference in the world, I'd want to get to the root of their value system. I'd want to get decent, caring people who want to give as well as take from society. Um, they're, they're not easy things to measure. Organizations today talk a lot about engaging both values and methods of operation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bottom line stuff as mm -hmm. well as values. Are they getting it? Some. Um, I mentioned to you before we began being live on to television that I spent yesterday with one guy who clearly is, and there are lots like that. And I'll give you two examples. One is Daniel Vassella, who's a um, Swiss, French Swiss, runs a large pharmaceutical company with a market capitalization of, I don't know, close to 300 billion. It's called Novartis, pharmaceutical company. Um, they put a lot of money in drugs that may not necessarily sell, orphan drugs. He is both concerned with the value base and also his, his shareholders. Howard Schultz, Starbucks guy, is interested, cares passionately about profitability, the delicate balance between <coughs> profitability, which is paying back to the shareholders, and employee satisfaction. He figures if he has good employees, who he really cares about their needs. That's why, by the way, he hasn't paid much dividends to, as, as he'd like to to the shareholders, because he's putting that into employee benefits, health care, even for part-time workers. He calls them partners, doesn't he? calls them partners, yeah. That's terrific. Yeah. Yeah, so to deal that deal like a balance between profitability and um, the humane, spiritual value side of an organization. If there is uh, something our viewers, me included, could focus on over the next, let's say, month. Yeah, I think it would probably be situations in which you felt your best self was being deployed and situations where you felt your your not best self, whatever that is, the not best self, the ones, the behaviors which you couldn't approve of yourself. And what, under what, what are those conditions? Because I think every organization, every leader has to be able to create an environment where people are deploying and expressing their best self. In your years of working with leaders, uh, what would you say is the most difficult concept for them to get? It varies with where they are in their career. Um, a new leader will not understand the significance of their words right away. And I think um, probably the multiple responsibilities and how you balance, what, how you create symmetry among your stakeholders. That's a hard one. It's a hard one to get and it's a hard one to do. When do you pay special to emphasize customers, vendors, employees, board members, shareholders, um, families of your, um, of your workers and people and so on. Right along with that question, uh, are there some barriers that would prevent uh, a company from producing up to their potential? Uh, to be very concrete about it, sure. Starbucks spends more money on educating and training its people than it does advertising. What percentage of the payroll is devoted to education and learning? Are they creating a culture of learning? Do they, st another factor, does the culture allow freedom for innovation, freedom for dissent? Does it encourage people to speak up and be real and to challenge the canon, to challenge the sacred cows? What uh, do you look for in the person that you follow? I mean, the, the, as a predecessor to? I mean, is no, that you, you follow. You were all yeah. leaders and followers. Uh, you're also, a leader. Well, also, I'm. You're a follower at this stage. What kind of person do you like to follow? You're following oh. the president of your university, for instance. Mm -hmm. What kind of qualities do you look for in the person that you're following? Mm -hmm. I, I want to. Is. I want to. I want to really participate in their dream. I want them to be a dreamer with their eyes wide open. Sure. Pragmatic idealists. I want. I want to buy into their dream. I want to think it is resonant with what my values are. I want them to show a power of acknowledgement that they really know and try to understand uh, what I can contribute and keep um, 
providing opportunities for me to, to grow in that. I want someone who um, has an ethical value base that I feel comfortable with. Those are the things I would look for. I think a concept that you brought up in one of your books um, is the concept of a boss versus a leader. Mm -hmm. Manager versus, yeah. And expressing yourself versus proving yourself. Right. Would right. you elaborate on that just for a moment? Yeah, I, well, I was trying to, I think the leaders I've known who are exemplary have gone beyond just doing it to, sh to prove who they are, to need the decorations, the epaulets, the, you know, the status, the position. And that's what they want, and they're always, and they're a bit fearful, because they're always proving. They're always, you know, and to a certain extent that's important. I still feel that when I give a talk, I still want to make it a good talk. Sure. But I think what's more important is that they're really expressing who they are, because that's what their followers are getting anyway. Sure. I, I loved it because it hit in an area where I needed some personal growth. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm in a conversation with someone, oftentimes if you're insecure, you find yourself trying to prove yourself right. rather than right. trying to express yourself. Yes. And it's been a great uh, tool for me to gauge that. Hmm, am I proving myself now or expressing yeah. myself? Yeah. Well, you know what? I'm really trying to prove myself. I'm trying to talk these people into thinking I'm really something because I'm, why am I feeling that way? I must feel a little insecure right now about who I am. So if I know that about myself, I can stop behaving that way. Mm -hmm. And you can start listening. Exactly, yeah, if you're absolutely. If you're proving yourself, you can't take time to, you know, you're sure. just on all the time. Integrity <laughs> is a word, I love that. Integrity is a word that's thrown around today. And uh, over the years, as I've thought about integrity and, and, and people are putting it in their value statements and everything today. Uh, I've always felt there was something missing. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the three prongs of integrity, mm -hmm. the tripod of integrity. Would you elaborate on that uh, for our viewers? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a cut at a very big idea, very big concept, and, and uh, I don't think this is the last word, but it's an introduction. I think about integrity, way of thinking about it is, think of a stool with three legs or a tripod, and one of the legs, one of the, of the stool or tripod is ambition. We all have that. Every single person has a certain degree of ambition, and, and all of us do. And another, the second uh, leg of the, of the stool would be competence, being good at something, business literacy, knowing your stuff, knowing the ropes, getting a P, you know, learning what, what it is you do. And the third part of the tripod is uh, the moral compass, the, the sense, the conscience, the sense of right and wrongness, the moral fabric of human being. Now those three things have to be kept in balance. That is the, if you can just imagine someone with just ambition, and I've known people like this, absent competence and moral compass, despots, dem they're demagogues, dictators, they're dangerous. Also bad spouses. Bad spouses, absolutely. So, uh, a person with just competence becomes a technician, bean counter, soulless, um, hapless person who's just simply watching, accounting. What a life, what a boring life. They're technocrats. Now, let's forget about, I don't know of anyone who's just, just moral, ethical person without the other two, nobody. Um, but if those three, when you start, when your ambition exceeds that competence or your what's right or wrong, your sense of what's right or wrong, that's an imbalanced tripod. That's a stool that is going to be always crooked. And you're going to feel uneasy on that stool. You really are. And more important, your organization is going to, I don't think, can, I view the moral compass as, a, as the foundation. If you can think metaphorically, I think of the, the foundation of any, the architecture is based on the moral value system of that, of that leader and the organization. If that decays, if that crumbles, I don't care how much ambition, I don't care how much competence, you're not going to make it. Because that's what keeps people together. That's what keeps the organization. You, you can see this in sports, you can see this in businesses, you can see this. Um, it's, it's just not going to hold together. In the long run, and, it's gonna, and you're not going to have 
shareholder profitability in the long run if you don't have that foundation. But all three have to be in balance. Yeah, you gotta produce, gotta be, you gotta have and you gotta have some value basis. I think it's a great concept for young people <clears throat> to learn because we often say, you can have ambition and we put a negative tilt on that just a bit or competencies, but you need integrity. And they don't realize oftentimes that integrity includes all three of those things. Ambition, competencies, mm -hmm. and moral compass. Mm -hmm. What would you most like to be remembered for? I Alex? would most what like to be remembered for being generous company. That Not necessarily the books I've written, but I, it's, I want to be thought of as being generous. Mm -hmm. Generous company would mean giving of yourself. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on our show. You are a delight. Uh, you have marked many people. You've been a mentor to people that have never met you, including myself. Um, and uh, I consider you a man that I'm going to continue to follow. Keep writing, keep producing. You have some great concepts, and I want to thank you so much for being on Leadership Track today with us, Dr. Bennis. Thank you, Mac. I really appreciate it. I love being here.